Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm the host, Sean Boyce. I'd like to welcome my guest to the show today, Jason Stats, who is a firm owner and creator. Uh, and he's also the uh, manager and the owner of the online community Realize, which is highly popular, uh, as well as he produces a ton of fantastic content on various topics and is very active on platforms like Twitter. Uh, so Jason, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Sean. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to kind of pick your brain about a lot. I know how yeah. one of the ways that we originally got connected was a video that I saw of yours over Twitter, where you're going back and forth with somebody who had a bone to pick with the uh, services provided in the accounting industry. And that was a yeah. super informative and interesting video. I think I've shared that at least a dozen times at this point with a ton of people. So your content is uh, fantastic. And you've got a really unique take on accounting industry in terms of where it's been and where it's going. I'd love to pick your brain and more about that on this episode. But before we do it, um, I'd love to, if you wouldn't mind sharing more about your background for our listeners so they can, you know, for those of, uh, that aren't aware, they can learn more uh, and uh, then we can dive into topics from there if that works for you. Yeah. So I came out of school doing accounting because I didn't know I didn't have anything else that that was really, you know, that I was being drawn into. Uh, it was one of those things where the internship paid better than any of my buddies internships and I haven't found a way out yet. So uh <laughs> That was, I don't know, 15 years ago. I came into public practice in small firms, didn't really want to do the big firm hustle, um, bought the firm I went to work for five years ago or so. Had a lot of fun building a cast practice uh, in what was traditionally a tax firm. Now we've got a team of just over 40 people. Uh, but then, yeah, a couple of years ago, started getting involved on Twitter, started doing some video production stuff and leaning more into kind of online communities and how us accountants can can work together to be better. Yeah, that's amazing. And I know a lot of your content as well, too, which makes you a great fit for this show, has been on kind of the more progressive things that are happening in the industry or should happen in the industry as it relates to tech, automation, and just more progressive concepts in terms of delivering better service for clients. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of what has been your kind of your focal point of uh, the content that you've produced? Because I know you produce a lot of great content on these topics, but where is it like you predominantly like to focus in terms of what gets produced? It all started with tech. I think accountants are just in such a great spot to be kind of the hub of all things data in a business. And most of the problems we're navigating are just data problems. They need to get from point A to point B, some sort of transformation in the middle. And honestly, if you look at a small to mid-sized business, I don't know that anybody's better positioned to be that wizard making things happen than the accountant who kind of lives at the middle of that. Uh, Personality-wise, they're kind of the last person you would think. Um, but how I got started was just talking on Twitter every day about the stuff that I thought was cool that I was enjoying that I was working on. And that was automating stuff in Zapier and exploring RPA and, and stuff like that. And just by being consistent over time, I attracted the people who were interested in the same things. And then it very quickly became clear, oh, we're all actually just doing the same things in parallel. How do we, how do we be more collaborative about this so that we all aren't reinventing the wheel kind of in our own siloed ways? So it started with tech and the fact that, you know, we all use QuickBooks. We all use this tax software. Why doesn't somebody build one bot and then we can all utilize that bot? Um, stuff as simple as that. Since then, it's gotten into, uh, you know, more kind of anything and everything that goes into running a firm and and that sort of stuff. But that was how we got started. Very cool. And I, I couldn't agree more. I've definitely underscored that point where accounts are uniquely positioned, I think. Where they have some of the most important data for any given company and the clients that they work with in terms of being able to make a pretty significant impact pretty much anywhere uh, for a business right because they're talking about how well that business may or may not be performing as such there's a lot of opportunity to be a trusted advisor and help get unstuck and grow from there and just offer valuable advice and all that type of stuff as well also and then you mentioned tech I think that's something obviously on this show that we talk quite a bit about in terms of what's underway at the moment, what's coming, what's next, where it's been. Uh, people, you know, taking issue with anything that 
that is currently offered in the industry at the moment and how they'd like it to be moving forward. I've seen a lot of innovation in the space as well, too, which I know you've kind of been at the forefront of. So love to pick your brain about all of it, but probably the place I like to start first to you know build this story arc is really where you've seen the industry at previously. And since you've been pushing kind of a lot of content in and around technology, where are some of the challenges in the industry in terms of its adoption along the technology kind of life cycle in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, what have accounting firms done well in the past, but also in particularly like kind of not done well in the past when it comes to technology, in your opinion? Uh, well, the big thing, you know, 10 years ago now that I think a lot of firms are still in the middle of has just been cloud adoption. So um, the value of, of, running your business on cloud apps that will talk to each other. It's often kind of misframed as, you know, QuickBooks online versus QuickBooks desktop when that's not really the discussion. The discussion is desktop software versus cloud software more holistically. In fact, you can pull all that stuff together. So that's that's a huge step. And, you know, a, a I think over half of small businesses in the US are still using a desktop accounting product um and it, it is it's it's frustrating you know there's i think there are accountants who are like I'm just not going to fight that battle i'm not going to support those clients on the flip side it's a huge opportunity uh you have the you have the opportunity to be the hero and kind of introduce them to a to a new way of working if you have the the patience and persistence to do that i think the next equally big step is the age of being able to build out your own bespoke integrations between those cloud apps that you use. So huge step getting from the desktop to the cloud where those apps will talk to each other where you have native integrations. I think the next really big step is bespoke integrations and having the ability to in your own in in a system of your own design push data between those different apps any way you want because the native integrations aren't necessarily going to do what you want. Uh, and when all of the data can go where it needs to go automatically, like that's a that's a huge change for how businesses are run, how we can advise our clients and like how far that support can go. We're almost, we've got firms now that are kind of like hybrid dev shops because they're finding those, those businesses with a big need. Um, but I think that'll be, that'll, that's kind of an interesting next, next step, I think. Well said. Those are two big ones for sure. A lot of activity in that space as well. Also, I want to pick your brain a bit for a moment. Like on the show, oftentimes we're talking kind of at that managing partner or partner level. And I I connect with a bunch. I know you do as well. But for those out there that want to start making some of these changes, regardless of where they might be, maybe more conservative, maybe more aggressive towards some of these things, what are the what's standing in the way, in your opinion? at these firms of these changes taking place and them having the ability to take advantage of what the technology has to offer. It's interesting. I think productivity, especially software-based productivity, historically has been a top-down sort of thing. So the company is going to implement this thing and it's going to make us all more productive. But I think we're getting to an age of more personal productivity where because we're able to design the things for the things, the specific tasks that we do and the way that we work, that that opportunity is more bottom up than top down. Um, so the things that I work on every day are different than the things my colleagues work on every day. But if I can, in 10 minutes, throw together a bot that will help me with this task, maybe when I'm away from my computer or I can build my own custom integration to connect A to B, and I'm the only one that has that problem, then the old model of institutionalized tech adoption doesn't really work. So it takes being at a place that will give you that flexibility and you know still having governance over data and being responsible with how all that is being done. But I think the future is more is more bottom up, which for a person like me, if I'm working at a at a company where I want the flexibility to do that is really exciting because that's a that's a way that I can really differentiate myself from my colleagues and be much more productive. 
for people who maybe are stuck in a, in, in circumstances where they don't have that flexibility, that can be really frustrating. Well said. I know, and I've connected with firms as well too, that they may have people at the partnership level who some are excited about incorporating some of these changes. And like you said, some others are just not going to tackle it. It's, it's almost kind of seems to be at a point where the industry is somewhat bifurcated, where you've got folks more traditional, maybe firms a little bit larger, maybe firms a little bit older, right? There's some characteristics that some may have in common that seem to be a little bit more adverse to these, some of these changes that are being proposed or where like where the industry is heading. Mm. And you've got, you know, new firms popping up on a regular basis, kind of a so-called like more modern firm where it's getting away from maybe the hourly model. They're doing more productized services. They're leaning pretty hard into technology. I'm curious to get your take on that in terms of what what do you think that landscape realistically looks like at the moment? And what do you think it will look like in the coming years? I love it. I, I think, I don't know if it's just I'm more aware of it than I've ever been before, but it's never seemed less homogenized. Like mm-hmm. all these firms are very, are, I think there's so many different paths you can take right now from being you know, basically a dev shop that says we're an accounting firm to your bigger old timey realization focused firms, which those firms aren't going to change. Like there's, they're still making gobs of money on that model and that's not going to change. Uh, and there's people that will enjoy that environment. And I think most people won't. So I see more of an opportunity for the small to mid-sized firms doing really interesting, compelling things. Um, but I, I, I'm excited at the prospect of, you know, as a firm owner myself, the ability for, for firms to kind of carve out a, carve out a different type of, of space going forward. Um, especially as you have, like you said, I think there's this like bifurcation of the old timey versus the new. And honestly, I see that same thing in small businesses like that. That gap is really wide as well. And so the firms that support them, like you need both sides of that. But the other interesting thing that I think we're encountering is as accounting firms become a little more like technology companies and we're we're leveraging stuff that scales that gap between the output of a firm clear down to the output of a person is getting bigger and bigger. So what like the scale of the impact that you can have and what you can do i think that spectrum has never been larger i think we see that right now with staff people who are able to like and we talked about that bottom-up automation like the people who are able to kind of build those things for themselves are able to be hyper productive at a level that we haven't seen before um i think leaning into tech and kind of the personalization of building your own bespoke automations is widening that gap of of productivity that's definitely a big one it's and i'm glad you mentioned this kind of top down bottom up approach because i have a lot of experience in technology as well too and historically that's been that's kind of what it's been right as in we're going to we're going to make a decision at a super high level and then it's going to propagate everywhere I think some of the challenges we've often seen there, and that's also, you know, dates all the way back to the desktop software days as well, too, where rollouts were complicated, software was installed manually on PCs and stuff like that. It was a really complicated logistical like operation, right? Expensive, time consuming, all kinds of combinations. You needed a small army sometimes to manage the whole process. But I think the biggest missed opportunity for some of that stuff is you didn't really incorporate oftentimes the people doing the actual work in the process. So you're kind of like picking, like picking a car for someone else kind of thing mm-hmm. <laughs> without asking them, you know, what type of size and type and car do they want kind of thing. Um, I think the bottom up is particularly interesting. And like you said, I think the technology now could be extended all the way to that point where it makes a lot of sense to figure out, well, like well, maybe we reverse this process, right? And start with what do you need to make the biggest impact? Like where are you stuck today? Let's address that first instead of basically like choosing for you, because now, you know, the possibilities are are plentiful and it's a lot more flexible. Yeah. I like to extend that analogy. It's it's you've got 100 people and you send out an email and say, we're going to buy this car for all for all 100 of you, as opposed to each of those people going out and actually doing what they need. Um, 
And that works in a humongous company where you've got entire departments of people doing the exact same thing, or it works better than you know the world that I live in. But when you've got people doing highly contextualized work that's not turnkey, yeah, you've got to like that's bottom up makes way more sense there when it comes to solving your own specific problems. Totally. Absolutely. And I think most firms would serve to benefit considering that strategy, potentially sometimes even regardless of size. And I think that makes it more interesting as well, too, for all their team members as well. Because it's one of those things where by the time you get the keys to that car, it's like, who ordered this? <laughs> and how have they ever met me? Kind of thing. Like, what am I supposed to do with this almost? I've seen so many of those instances where it's like a clear mismatch. It's like, you know, quick quick search would have found something that had been much more appropriate had the discovery kind of been done at that level. But now with the tools being somewhat ubiquitous and significantly more cost effective, a lot more flexible, available to be used over the cloud, you know, the no code revolution, that kind of thing. The possibilities are almost seemingly endless at this point of figuring out how you can help your team be that much more productive. So now the this is getting to my question for you, which is, the good and bad of that is there's a lot of options. The bad is there's a lot of options, right? So how do professionals at accounting firms who want to realize that, but really don't even know where to start, how do they make heads or tails of all of these options and figure out what to do for their team that's going to make the biggest impact that helps them and the overall firm as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the way software is going um this is the best it's ever going to be uh you know it's just going to get worse because you're going to have more and more products that do similar things so if you're overwhelmed right now uh it's it is only going to get much much worse honestly like that's where people like me i think come in to fill that space so that's you know the function of my weekly newsletter where i try to like sift through honestly, hundreds and hundreds of new apps every single week to pull out the couple that are relevant for accountants. And so I think there's kind of like going to be personalities or platforms that aggregate that stuff and and kind of float at the top because you're never going to be able to cull through all that stuff yourself. Um, it's also the function of accounting conferences and, and, and stuff like that, I think, to to see who's investing in our, our little um, corner of the tech universe. Uh, but also to keep beating the same drum, you know, the top down versus bottom up, um, top down, um, top down is working against a lot of inertia. So top down is big changes. It's all these people are doing this thing. Now all these people are going to do these, this other thing and tech adoption now needs to be more iterative. It doesn't need to, it shouldn't be a big commitment. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, I think a big, argument for a more bottom-up tech discovery so it takes trying stuff in your team you know trying stuff at a rate where you have maybe never tried stuff before uh, and starting small with individual team members and them them trying out those tools seeing what works and what doesn't work about them either keeping that tool or that informing the stuff that you explore next uh, but i think it it takes a more iterative approach um, everybody's been through, you know, the experience of, of whiplash when that top down institutionalized tech change is just happening too fast and pulling you in different directions. So it's gotta be, it's gotta be starting small with individual people in your team, like having a culture of, we're always sort of iterating through different ideas and, and options. Um, so it's bouncing act. It's, it's finding that place where I can trust someone to give me the most important things to try. And then having a more of a, a culture of iteration where on a small scale, we're going to try out different things rather than pulling people through, you know, the whole team through all of these different things every six months. Well said. I want to pick your brain as well about what you see happening in the future for any firms that are more resistant to the changes that are underway in the industry. What does the future, in your opinion, look like for them? And what type of philosophy should they adopt? ideally instead of that in order to prevent what might be an outcome that they're not interested in or looking for. Uh, honestly, I think those firms are going to be just fine as long as there's businesses that are living in the same space. So if 
if those firms are going to run into trouble, it's going to be because the businesses they support that also work that way run into trouble. Um, so I see it more on the more on the commercial side. Are those old timey businesses going to be able to maintain relevance? Um, and I would say just from the nature of the world that we live in, where everything is is increasingly higher leverage, because we're leaning into things that scale rather than than you know human inputs that don't scale, I would say there's definitely a risk. There's definitely a risk to those old timey businesses, and there will be fewer and fewer of them. That being said, as we're all leaning into productization and 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 stuff being more software driven the counter to that will be more of a premium for the hands-on human experience. And so that will always be there in some capacity, but I think just the, the industry of, of old timey small businesses who are not leaning into scale and all of that will be shrinking. And so the ability for firms, you know, the, the, the ideal clients out there for those types of firms uh, will be fewer and fewer um we'll see i think depends on the size of the firm i think most of the life the life cycle of those firms tracks with the people who run those firms and so a big a big issue there could be why would anybody go out and buy an old-timey firm right now i think most people agree the cost you know paying paying even 80 percent revenue for an old-timey firm right now is more expensive than organic because it's just shooting fish in a barrel to go out and find clients right now. So um, we'll see. As, as long as there's old-timey businesses to support, I think there's going to be some old-timey firms around, but it, it will definitely shrink. Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting element, which I think makes sense as well, too. As productization continues to spread throughout the industry, I imagine what we'll probably continue to see is what can be productized successfully. We'll yeah. probably continue, but the customization custom options not going away right like there's always going to be high demand for that and what we might actually see is for the people that do an effective job of making sure they're that specialist of the right combinations of what needs to be done in a custom way that the price for that and the demand for that will probably only rise mm -hmm. as you know the rest of the industry becomes somewhat not like commodity not quite commoditized but productized mm -hmm. as well also because that's what i wanted to pick your brain about next was with those changes that are underway and, you know, the, the somewhat of a push to get away from the hourly billing model uh, and, and less of an output, more of an outcome orientation, the productization starts to, especially those more progressive modern firms that are, that are spinning up and incorporating a lot more tech, automating as much as they can, right? Offering the service in a different way. How far do you think that will go in the accounting industry? And what will, what do you think that landscape will look like when it kind of reaches its, uh, it's it's peak. I think it's going to be dictated by the scarcity in the accounting industry, how many accountants we have. So mm -hmm. product dye solutions will always fill up the bottom of the market. And that's that's the the lowest cost entry point sort of customers in the market. If there is a quarter of the accountants 10 years from now that there are today, the product dye options will will fill that 75% because they don't have another option, right? So um I think productized stuff will explode, not because productized stuff's great and it's a better experience than than something else, but because there's not going to be another option. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the the only the only things accountants stand to lose is not recognizing that they're better than that productized option, and you know, pricing themselves, you know, like a bench or a pilot or or something like that. So. It's not unlike, you know, TurboTax, you know, when TurboTax first came out, I'm sure everybody was saying, oh, it's the death of the tax preparer and they, they are, they're taking the bottom of the market and it's awesome. It's the stuff that I don't want to do. And it yep. gets a little, little better each year and, and, and climbs up, you know, and does, can handle a little more, a little more each year. But honestly, right now, that's exactly what we need because we don't have enough accountants. So I see it, you know, we, we oftentimes grapple with, boy, I don't want these $300 1040s anymore, but who's going to do them if I don't? Right. Well, H&R Block is going to do them for $400. So I, I would love to see more productization and more people coming into that space because accountants obviously are becoming more and more scarce and that problem is just going to get worse. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. Looking at it from the perspective of basically what's the biggest bottleneck in the industry. And at the moment, one of those for sure is just access to talent, people that can actually do the work, especially as it gets more complicated and it gets steps outside of that productized realm. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's where we've seen most of the kind of innovation come from. And I think it's, like you said, likely to probably continue from here. So uh, last question I have for you, although I could ask you questions about this stuff all day. Uh, mm. There's so many interesting angles to explore here. Yeah. And your expertise is so um, so significant. Is where do you think the biggest opportunity is for accounting firms at the moment, and how should they go about exploring that? So, if you were to take over, you know, step into another firm today, what are some of the first things that you would do and explore that they may not, you know, have done yet or have explored in order to set them up as best as possible for growth and success into the future? Oh, biggest opportunity! What a question, Sean. Uh... I always so I always try to say tell people that it's very contextual um, and it should be driven by what are the things you're going to enjoy doing. So if I'm a real tech nerd, if I went out and started a firm from scratch tomorrow, it'd be an accounting firm. But 75 percent of the work that we would do would be high leverage tech like dev house type stuff, because that'll scale all day long. People are paying you a fixed fee for all the stuff that you built for them. And I don't have to do work on that stuff every month, but that's because I love tech stuff and I'm a total dweeb in that way. Um, if you love, you know, if, if you go into work at your accounting firm and prepare tax returns all day, and then you go home and you do watercolor paintings and that's, that's all you want to do. That's all you have a mind for that person's biggest opportunity is just being the most rad tax preparer accountant for, for people that do what you love. Uh, but they don't, but they don't understand or or they're, they're too afraid to get that specific because they can't see that world right now with where they're at. Um, so spec greater specificity, I think for most people is the biggest opportunity and having the courage to close the door to a whole bunch of stuff they're doing right now, trusting that on the other side of that door, there's going to be a whole bunch more opportunity that they just can't see yet. Um, I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, other, other more nuts and bolts, practical stuff. We're still super, super, super early days on small firms and adoption of offshore talent. Um, I think it's happening more out of necessity, but, um, our clients are getting more comfortable with it because every other service they use did it 20 years ago. Um, as small businesses become more comfortable with it and start leaning into it, it's going to be less of a big, big deal for us to do it ourselves. I think most the the fear for most practitioners comes from what will my clients say um but that's just becoming more and more normal in fact you can lead your clients down that path to say you ought to you ought to consider offshore as well you've got all of these things where you can pull people in to help you're having hiring problems how does somebody at you know half the cost who can do the job just as well sound uh so in many ways you can kind of champion that with your clients uh and then last um, j just like leaning into the age we're entering of having full control over your data for the first time. We didn't mm -hmm. have that in the desktop days. We didn't even have that in the early cloud days because early cloud days was your options are native integrations, which is better than nothing, but is also ripe for abuse. It's uh, these companies are willing to partner with these companies and there's there's you know, to, to put the tinfoil hat on, there's uh, a lot of connections they would make and ones that they wouldn't make that wouldn't always be in your best interest. But I think now we're getting to an age of of more than ever having control over our own data so that we can dictate where it goes, pull in an expert to make sure that it's happening on an automated basis. And like that's that unlocks anything from wanting to do more valuable work to not wanting to work as much to being more profitable. And that's, that's the thing that probably gets me most excited is what we do becoming higher leverage. Super, super valuable, super interesting. I was going to say the exact same thing at the end there. The possibilities that are available now for all of the reasons that you just mentioned are really exciting in the industry. So I'm super curious to keep a close eye on it um, and watch, you know, what happens because it's going to open up a lot of area of opportunity for firms that are willing to kind of take that leap and make those investments. 
you mentioned so many good ones, right? The specificity, extending your team, increasing your leverage. There's a lot of really exciting opportunity available for firms at the moment. And uh, Jason's one of the best people to ask about it. So I'm, I'm super thankful to have you on the show to talk about these topics because a lot of the content you produce is fantastic in all of these areas. And um, I've got only a couple questions for you before we let you go. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love the opportunity to kind of promote a ton of the work that you do in producing all that great content and where folks can go to find more about it. So are there any resources in particular where you would direct folks where they can learn more about that or anything else we talked about on the show? I spend most of my time on Twitter. Um, if you aren't there yet, there's a bunch of really smart accountants hanging on Twitter that are learning from each other. The best way to stay plugged into all the stuff that I do, I've got a weekly newsletter, subscribe.jason.cpa. You can sign up for it there. And that's tracking everything from the videos I do for helpful stuff to the conference talks to uh, accounting memes to new tech discovery and and everything in between. I've seen a lot of Jason's videos and they are not just super um, entertaining. They're <laughs> really valuable. So you learn a lot and you have a good time while you're doing it. So definitely follow him on Twitter and sign up for his newsletter as well, too, because there's so much awesome content. And then last question I have for you, Jason, is who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Oh, man. Uh anyone i i get please not software companies i get too many emails from software companies hey can you help me with this or that what i always tell people at me on twitter and i'm going to respond i've learned everything that i know cheating off of other people and and lurking on their conversations and i think the best way to to share knowledge is just have that conversation in public so reach out to me on twitter happy to have that conversation. And the best thing is you usually get five or 10 people that hop in with their own context and it's even better than it would have been otherwise. Super well said. Thank you for that. I will link to all the information that you shared as well too in the show notes. So for listeners, if you're wondering kind of where to go and you want an easy access to that stuff, just check out the show notes for this episode. Jason, I can't thank you enough for being here and sharing your knowledge and experience with both myself and our audience. You bet, Sean. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of Accounting Automation. I hope you found it valuable. I help accounting firms scale their profit exponentially without needing to hire any additional accountants. So if your firm is in growth mode and can't keep up, I'd love to talk to you more about how I can empower your firm to do more with less through automation and technology. To learn more, visit my website, nextstep.io, or email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's sean, S-E-A-N, at nextstep, N-X-T, step.io.